Hello, everybody. My name is Dmitry Abakumov. Uh, I'm uh, the seminar chair uh, today and uh, always at this seminar. Uh, I'm glad to welcome you all uh, at the fifth international seminar on computational educational sciences. Uh, our seminar is aimed at building the research community and thinking together uh, on challenging problems uh, on the intersection of education, uh, quantitative research and computational science. Uh, our, se our seminar is hosted and sponsored by the Center for Computational Educational Sciences of uh, HEC University, Moscow, Russia. And uh, today I am uh, extremely grateful to our speaker, uh, Dr. Maria Gianelli, for her kind acceptance to present at our seminar. Uh, Maria works at the American Museum of Natural History and the City University of New York, the United States of America. And I'm excited to have uh, her talk on effects of pretests and feedback on performance outcomes and persistence in massive open online courses. Uh, but before giving Maria the virtual, uh, virtual, vir virtual uh, microphone, I would like to inform you all uh, about the seminar plan. So we will start with the 30, 35, uh, maybe more, uh, minutes uh, presentation from Maria. Then we will have around 40 minutes uh, for questions and open discussion. We, uh, as always, uh, we have two options to ask the question. So the first one is you can type the question in an open chat and I will voice it. And I think that this is the, uh, from the, our experience from past seminars, it is the most popular uh, option. And the second, you still can use your own voice. And uh, for this, uh, you have to use a raise hand button and I will give you the uh, virtual microphone. And the gentle suggestion, if possible, please use your web cameras on uh, during the seminar to provide the kind feeling which we missed a lot uh, of real physical audience. Uh, and with this, uh, like with this note, I would like to wish all of you to be uh, healthy and safe uh, at this uh, period of pandemic. And thank you for your understanding. Well, now please join me in warmest, our warmest welcoming Dr. Maria Gianelli at our virtual stage. Maria, you are very welcome, please. Thank you very much, Dimitri, for that warm welcome and thank all of you for having me today. It's really nice to be with colleagues from around the world. I haven't done that in a year. Uh, I was just telling Dimitri, it's been a little bit more than a year since I've been back to my office in the museum and this is my first sort of virtual gathering like this. And it's really, really nice to be back in this space. Uh, I think we're a small enough group here today uh, that I hope we can keep this conversational. So uh, no, I'm not gonna take more than 30 to 35 minutes to talk at you. I'd much rather use our time together to have a conversation about the work we're all doing, but I'm certainly happy to kickstart that by sharing some of the research I've been doing in Coursera. So I'm gonna share my screen now, head over to some slides, uh, describe the research that I'm doing, and then hopefully we can have a conversation about how it relates to the, the good work all of you are doing. All right, so as uh, as Dimitri said, we're gonna spend some time here talking about the effects of pretests and feedback on learning and persistence in massive open online courses. This was a collaboration between folks at the City University of New York Graduate Center in the Educational Psychology Program, the American Museum of Natural History, and of course, Coursera. Uh, so this research started because I had been doing a lot of reading about three key areas for me. The first was about testing and the idea that testing is not just about assessment, that you can use testing as instruction, that the act of taking a test can sometimes uh, be a method for teaching. And I found that fascinating. It really moved away from the stigma around testing and started to think about it in a positive way. Uh, the second thing I was focusing on is the benefits of pretests. There's so much literature that shows how instructive a pretest can be when students take them consistently. 
And the third area I was interested in is feedback and how it's so context dependent and how when it is done well, it is a really effective instructional method. But all the research I'd been reading was primarily done with traditional students sitting in traditional classrooms. And I wondered whether or not all of this interesting literature would apply to non-traditional students in non-traditional classrooms, because that's who I work with in Coursera and in my work at the museum. So that was sort of the genesis of this research. And what I decided to do was an experimental study in Coursera that looked at the effects of pretests and feedback on learning and persistence in a climate change course in Coursera. So the American Museum of Natural History created the climate change course. We offered it on Coursera and my colleagues and I at the City University of New York uh, conducted the experiment. So I'm gonna go really quickly through the literature review. All of this is, is stuff you're already familiar with and all of the citations are in my papers about this, but the highlights for me are that um, pretests can provide better learning outcomes even if you give people a test prior to teaching them anything. And that's because the act of taking a test is active, whereas reading is a very passive experience. So when you engage people's minds in action around testing, they're more likely to encode the information in their brains um, because there's an element of engagement. Multiple choice tests have a terrible reputation, but they can actually be quite effective because they can teach students through the process of identifying and eliminating the lures or the, the false answers uh, in a question. Digital tests also sort of have a bad reputation probably because they are often multiple choice tests. But one incredible advantage of digital tests is that you can give feedback very quickly, which is something that is very hard to do face to face. And then feedback, the interesting part of feedback, which makes it a challenge for an online platform, is that it's very context dependent. And when you're designing instructional material for thousands and thousands of students, it's really hard to design it for every context possible. Um, so that was a bit of a challenge. Um, the broad overview is that testing and feedback can positively affect learning, but they can also have negative effects. If you think about uh, what I just said about multiple choice questions and lures. Yes, identifying lures can teach a student what is wrong, but if they think a wrong answer is right, then that reinforces false information for them. So that's one of the possible negative effects. Um, so the purpose of the, the current study I'm gonna share with you was to contribute to this growing body of knowledge by adding a new component, which is the non-traditional learner in a non-traditional online classroom. Um, so just a bit about the background, uh, the American Museum of Natural History is 150 years old. It's been offering online educational programming in one form or another for the past 20 years. And it was one of the founding um, professional development um, providing partners with Coursera back in 2013. So it's been almost 10 years now. You all know the data on Coursera, you know, 200 institutional partners, 3,500 courses, more than 40 million learners from around the world. Uh, it, the numbers are just baffling and really, really amazing from a research perspective. The museum's partnership with Coursera uh, consists of six courses with 150,000 people who have taken them over the past few years. Uh, the courses, I mean, you all know Coursera, I don't have to go into this too much, but they're, the climate change course is five modules long, an introductory video, in this case, the experimental conditions, uh, the video and the essay content, uh, and then the post uh, test that we offered at the end of each module. So this is the design of the study. Once I found out that Coursera could really easily do an A-B uh, experiment with random assignment, uh, I decided to really push the envelope and do an ABCD experiment to have four conditions. So you'll see here in the chart, the first column is a survey, which I'm not including in this study. It's part of a second study, so um, we can just ignore that for now. But the four conditions were uh, a group that got a pretest at the start of every module with no feedback whatsoever. The second group got a pretest with basic feedback, and that's was the answer right or wrong. 
correct or incorrect. The third group got elaborate feedback. So was the answer right or wrong and why? What did you answer correct? Like, like what's the information behind the answer? Uh, the fourth group was the control. They only got the pretest. We offered the pretest at the start of each of the five modules and the post test at the end. So there were 10 total assessments, five pre, five post. These are the, the questions I was interested in looking at. Were there differences in the post test scores among the four groups? Did the group you were in have any effect on your score um, across the five post tests? Were there group differences in the level of course persistence? How many modules did you complete? And was it dependent on the feedback you got? Uh, and what were the effects of course completion, which of course we all know is very closely tied to persistence, but the difference for my study was, uh, I defined persistence as the number of modules completed and completion as whether or not you completed all five modules. So they, they build on each other. Uh, I collected data for one year and because of the way, you know, Coursera auto starts courses, there were 12 course offerings in that one year of data collection. I worked with the Coursera data team to generate a SQL script that would extract the data from the Coursera data tables that I downloaded. And if folks are interested in, in this part of the project, uh, I'm happy to share scripts with you because this was by far the hardest part of the research was digesting and rewriting SQL for the Coursera uh, tables. So now I get into sort of the interesting stuff, like after a year, what did we find? So I downloaded the data, I took a look at it. Before cleaning it, we had responses from 606 participants. So we had 1,444 pretests and we had 2,952 post-tests for 606 participants. And then we had to clean it. Part of my IRB approval meant I could only include data from adults. So I had to delete the data from anyone who identified as a minor. That was important for IRB, but it was also a deliberate design of the study. Most of the research on testing and feedback looks at grade school kids or undergraduates in college. There's very little in the literature that looks at testing and feedback for adult students because they're not traditional. So I deliberately excluded minors from the data. I deleted multiple submissions. So if you took a test seven times, that was great. I hope you learned, but I only looked at the first submission. I didn't look at anything after that. Um, I deleted the responses from people who cheated. And by cheated, I mean, they tried to game the system by taking the post-test before the pre-test. Um, that confounded the data. So I took those out. I deleted the responses of anybody who had less than 20 minutes between the pre-test and the post-test because it means they didn't spend any time on the content. They just went through and took all the tests. Uh, and then I only kept matched pairs. So if you took the module one pretest and skipped the post test, I deleted your pretest from the data. I only wanted complete sets so that I could have an accurate representation of learning from module to module. The second part of cleaning the data was making new variables. So I made a composite post test score, which I'll describe in a minute. And then I wanted to track the number of modules completed, whether or not they completed the course. And then I appended survey data from the Coursera and museum demographic surveys that we had sent out. Um, so that's the sort of cleaning that we did. Once that was done, uh, we ended up with just under 400 participants, 399 people in the, in the sample, 846 total pre-tests, uh, and 1,200 uh, post-tests. So we still had quite a robust data set that we were working with. So this is where the data gets a little murky is around demographics. A lot more people take quizzes than submit surveys. I don't know what your experiences are like in the courses you run, but our survey rate is atrocious. Um, so out of 399 participants, we only had 66 people who responded to the surveys. So the demographic data is incomplete, but based on what we did get, we know that we have representation from at least 17 countries around the world. 76% of respondents uh, reported that they are white. And it is a very, very well-educated group who took this climate change course. 89% had at least a bachelor's degree 
99% had at least a high school diploma. So um, contrary to sort of the narrative around MOOCs, this audience wasn't comprised of people who didn't really have degrees and were looking for information. These were already well-educated people who were looking for very specific science information. So this is uh, the samples that we end up with. Uh, you can see that Coursera's uh, random assignment worked very well with a nearly even split 25% across the board. So we had uh, just about 100 people in each group, the no feedback, basic feedback, elaborate feedback and control uh, totaling our 399 people. So the samples were pretty evenly distributed. I first started by looking at the pretest scores across all five modules for all three groups. And I wanted to make sure there were no significant differences here, that the populations in the sample were relatively evenly distributed when it came to their pretest scores, and they were. There were no differences here. But we're going to come back to this when I talk about findings, because it turns out um, that pretests were, were an interesting insight into some of the surprising findings we had. This is post-test scores, so we have our means here, but what I wanna draw your attention to is that last column, the post-test composite score. Because people don't complete all the modules, we needed to create a composite score to represent their level of learning, regardless of how many modules they completed. So the post-test composite score was a new variable that was equal to the average of an individual's post-test score. So if you only took modules one, four, and five, your post-test composite score was the average of those submissions. During data analysis, we looked at every question from the perspective of the individual modules and the post-test composite score to make sure our analysis was very thorough. Um, but there's nothing in that post-test composite score that threw off the findings in the other areas either. So this is the modules completed. Um, and again, this is how we define persistence as the number of modules completed. So you can see um, that the control group had three point, an average of 3.4 modules completed, which was on the high end, and the low end was the group that didn't get feedback, and they had an average of 2.6 modules completed. And we're going to get into this again once I get some charts up on the screen. Uh, and here's course completion. And here the, you know, it's really stark. Again, the control group out ahead, 50.5% of the control group completed the course, which from a MOOC perspective is, is an incredibly high number. Uh, and then again, the pretest no feedback group was on the low end with just 22% of people in that group completing. And that's much more in line with what we expect from our MOOC participants. So what are the key findings uh, from this research? The first finding, which was not expected and was disappointing, is that pretests and feedback, they don't affect performance outcomes. There was no significant difference in the post-test scores among the four groups, and we were really surprised. We expected that the treatment groups would do better because they had access to feedback. And we expected that the group that got the elaborate detailed feedback would do better than the other two pretest groups because simply they had more content. Um, so that's the first surprising finding. Why might this be? So we're, we've come back to this pretest uh, mean scores chart. And it turns out that feedback, not surprisingly, is less effective if you lack the prior knowledge to build it upon. So if you don't have a solid foundation of information, feedback is meaningless because you can't build on what you don't know. And if we look at modules two, three, and four, you can see that the average score for those three treatment groups uh, in those three modules is really low, less than 50% across the board. Of course, that doesn't explain anything about module one and module four, where the prior knowledge was higher um, but it's a possibility that lack of prior knowledge had an effect on this very surprising outcome. Uh, the second finding is that taking pretests negatively affected persistence. So if you want people to continue progressing through a course, don't give them pretests. Uh, and this is what that looks like. You can see. Uh, so I have the five modules are the x-axis, and then each of the colored bars represents a different uh, condition. 
the control group by far and away um, completed the most modules uh, with five on the end there. And then you can see there's just a terrible decrease in engagement for the three treatment groups. And that decrease is less pronounced for the control group. They just, they did more. They were less discouraged from completing the course. Um, and then this builds on that. Finding number three, if you put pretests in a course, fewer people will complete it. And that's really clear here. So the x-axis this time is the four treatment groups and the two bars are looking at whether or not they completed. And you can see uh, here very easily, the control group has the most completers compared to the three treatment groups. It just, it was, there was no contest here. Um, so this was another significant finding. And then I did some more digging because I, I felt like um, the questions I asked might not have been the right questions that if I'm going to look at non-traditional learners, maybe I need to do some sort of non-traditional analysis. So the, the fourth finding here was about um, persistence. So among those who do persist, pretests positively affect learning outcomes. And that looks like this. Um, so this is the mean post-test composite score for course completers. So we had 138 people complete the course. Um, that's, that's, uh, that N is 138. For that group, the treatment group had a much higher composite score than the control group. And the effect size here was 0.46. This was a pretty strong finding. And the way I think about this is, if you're going to complete the course, if you are someone who is completed to taking a course in its entirety, then it's beneficial to take pretests because you will learn more over time compared to those in the control group who were also committed to completing the course, but didn't get as much material. And then the last major finding we have is that among those who take pretests, so this is just the treatment group, there's a positive effect of persistence on learning outcomes. The N here for the three treatment groups is 296, and this was the strongest effect size in the study at 0.54. And what this basically shows is um, the, um, the effect of practice and distributed practice, which we know is a testing phenomenon. Um, so if you are exposed to pretests and you take them over time, you do get better, you learn more. And you can see that those who took pretests and did all five modules had a much higher post-test composite score than those who did not. So there is an effect of taking a test, but there's even greater effect of taking that test over time. Uh, so some quick possible explanations. We were really surprised by these findings. Uh, we really, really thought feedback would make a difference and we're very disappointed to find that it did not. Um, what are some possible explanations? Um, we already talked a little bit about limited prior knowledge. Um, it could also be that there were some structural elements of the test that contributed to this finding. The pre and post test questions were not identical. We did that deliberately. They were questions about the same themes, but they were not the same questions. So that might have been part of it. Um, some people didn't get the, the correct answer. That might have been another part of it. It might be really important to know what the correct answer is so you can correct misinformation as you progress through a course. You all know from your own work in online learning that you can't, you can't dictate the time between tests in Coursera. Some people took a test an hour after reading the material. Some people took a test a month later, um, which is more a measurement of recall than of learning because there's so much time between. There also could have been an effect of pre-searching where you know, people Googled the answer to questions or they read things out of order. So that could be another explanation. The other one is we talked about a bit already is the context around feedback and how everybody's context is very unique. Um, whether or not people took the time to review the feedback. Were there people who just chose to ignore it entirely? What about people's intrinsic and extrinsic motivation around receiving feed feedback? And then reading level, uh, we had, you know, a lot of international learners and the course was in, is in English. Was that potentially a barrier? Um, and then more broadly, there's just an inability to generalize findings because 
there just hasn't been a whole sorry, lot. Sorry, I'm having trouble. Sorry, here. there just hasn't been a whole lot of research in this area yet. And then explanations for the effects on post-test scores and persistence. Again, um, so the findings that we found were really context dependent and only affected those who completed the course. You know, feedback and pretests only mattered if you completed the course. But the findings we did have were consistent with the MOOC literature and with literature more broadly. Broadly speaking, students who took the pretest did better if they completed the course and there was an effect of distributed practice. Regarding course completion, there's no similar findings in the literature because traditional learners don't have this option to just stop taking a course at the midpoint. You know, if you're taking a course for graduate credit, you finish it. You don't just, you know, show up for the first five weeks and then decide to leave and then get included in a study. Um, so you can't really compare the literature in both areas. Um, and then MOOC research is still new. I know it's, you know, Coursera has been around since 2012, 2013, um, but that's new in terms of how we have been studying learning. That's not a very long time at all. Um, so, so I think we'll continue to see variations on this, I hope, um, because it would be nice to know how a study like this would stack up at another institution. Um, so there's some relevant MOOC research that applies to this study. Um, so some researchers have found a negative correlation between people who are enrolled in STEM courses and engagement. This was a climate change course. This was very clearly a STEM course, and maybe that had an effect. Um, there's a positive relationship between instructors and persistence. I don't know how others have structured their MOOCs, but at the museum, we moved away from having a live instructor in the course because it just wasn't cost effective. Um, we just couldn't scale our instructional staff for the number of people in the courses. So it is a self-guided course with no instructor presence beyond the recorded videos. That might've had an effect on persistence. Um, there has been research that shows that pre-course survey submissions predict course completion, and that could absolutely be true we had 66 people complete the course. And that could definitely be an indication of what course completion rates might look like. But more interestingly, I think for us at the museum and perhaps for this community here is I think we need to reconceptualize how we think about teaching and learning in MOOCs and online. This is a chart we made at the museum way back in 2013 when we started to look at our Coursera data. And it's, it's dated because it's old now. But we had these two funnels. On the left, we had the number of people enrolled and then the number of people who actually logged into the course. And then the number of people who actually watched videos or looked at readings. And the funnel gets narrower, the more specific the engagement becomes. Same thing on the right. You start with video views. It's an easy thing to do. A lot of people did it. Then submitting quiz. Well, then you have fewer people. The level below that was participating in forums, which requires even more engagement. So even less people did it. And then submitting an assignment. And then the last one at the bottom is doing all of the things required to get a certificate, which back in the day was called the signature track in Coursera. And, you know, at the top we had uh, 238,000 video views. And at the bottom, we had less than 700 people get the certificate. So we, from the beginning, have seen this funnel effect in Coursera that we weren't seeing anywhere else in our programming. And this is what this might look like today. This is from uh, an article called Changing Course, Reconceptualizing Educational Variables for MOOCs. And I want to talk you through this graphic because I think it will resonate with all of you. The Top part of it with all the lines, that's the traditional course structure. And it's the typical student trajectory. So you have units and you have tests and every student in a course progresses along the same line. It's one course and one line, one progression for the entire group. And then you look down at the second half of the image which has a bunch of squigglies and that's the MOOC structure and each squiggle represents the path of a different student. Every student in a MOOC is going to take a different path. And yet we're designing our MOOCs with one path. And that can be problematic. And it is a reason to rethink how we create programming for learners in MOOCs. 
This is from a uh, colleague at the London School of Economics. If you were at the last in-person Coursera conference in 2019, you may have been at the session where she showed this. The colorful line of dots along the top, that's uh, a linear algebra course. That's how it was designed. The blue dots represent videos. The yellow dots represent essays. The red dots are quizzes. The green dots are interactives. And the purple dots are coding assessments. It is a linear course. And you can see that very clearly in that top line. The squiggles at the bottom are, it's a network path analysis of the pathways taken by learners in the course. So you can see very few people took that course in a straight line. Everybody, almost everybody jumped and took the course out of order. For people who went through this course, 70% of learners took the course out of order. Only 30% took it in order. So I think this is not a bad thing. I think what this tells us or it tells me is that we need to focus on the benefits of the platform because now that we know this, we can do more with it. So here's what I think the implications of this are. We need to shift the conversation from completion to learning. People aren't taking free MOOCs because they wanna complete a course. They're taking it because they're looking for specific information. And once they get that information, they leave the course. And that's not bad. That means they found what they needed, took it and left. And that's a win as far as I'm concerned as a content creator and as an instructional designer. I think we need to give pretests with correct answers at the end. Um, if that's the learning moment, um, it's a real opportunity to, to give people the correct information before they continue into a course. Um, we need to give module level tests instead of course level tests because not everybody takes the entire course. And if you build in your assessments at the module level, then you're giving people more of an opportunity to demonstrate what they know at the points where they wanna enter the course. If pretest completion is important, then we might think about gamification making people incentivized um, to take the pretests and maybe tying the pretest to course grades. The pretests in this particular study were not tied to course grades and that might've been a disincentive for completion. Moving down the sort of hierarchy, I think we might wanna think about adaptive courses and assessments where the assessment questions you get are based on the information you demonstrated, you understand it previously. Another version, which is a little bit harder to do is make two versions of a course, one for those who say they want to complete it and one for those who say they don't. If you intend to complete a course, you get the version with the pretests because we know that getting a pretest for those people will help them learn more. If you don't intend to complete the course, you don't get the pretest because we know that's just going to discourage you from persisting in the course. So let's remove that barrier to persistence. And then the third one is very fancy and it's sort of the holy grail for me and I don't know that we'll ever get there because it's very expensive. And that's what I call the choose your own adventure mod model. Um, and that's sort of where you can imagine a person signing up to take a course and they do a very quick survey. Do you enjoy learning with videos, quizzes, interactives, readings? In this climate change course, what are the most important things for you to know? sea level rising, atmosphere, global climate models, what are the things that interest you? Do you intend to complete this course, yes or no? Click submit and then you get a custom version of a course. It's got the specific content you want, the types of content you want, and the assessments that you want. So that the entire learning experience becomes student-centered and not sort of institutional centered. It's not me as the content creator imposing a sequence of content on all of these learners. It's providing a buffet menu and saying, you know, everybody's welcome at this table. Take what you want and leave what you don't. And I don't know that we'll get there, but that's for me the exciting part of what's on the horizon. Every study has limitations. Uh, mine was certainly no exception. We all know that attrition is abysmal in Coursera. So that was also the case here. There were 399 people in the study. There were thousands of people who took the course and just never did a single quiz. Um, so attrition is a big problem. The survey response rate we talked about. 
you know, participants in their environments, you can't control that in a MOOC. Some people might've taken the course on a mobile phone. Some people might've taken it on an iPad. Some people might've taken it on a laptop. You can take it quietly in your bedroom or you can take it like in a noisy train station. Those are things you just can't control. There may have been non-sequential behavior that we couldn't track. You know, people might have read essays or watched videos before taking the pretest. Um, we talked about that a little bit and we talked about the time between activities as being another potential limitation. So what does the future look like? I think I can take this current data set and do some different things with it, looking at the relation between, you know, post-test scores and the number of attempts um, and the effect of feedback for second submissions. So did feedback affect your second pretest quiz score? could modify the design to force sequential progress on people so you can't just jump into the course and do module four without module one. That's sort of antithetical to my own belief about online instruction. Um, I can embed the pre-core survey to hopefully get more people to respond to it. And then I could replicate it. You know, I could use it in a different museum MOOC. I could do it, I could partner with another organization who maybe teaches a poetry MOOC and do a similar study and see if maybe it's a domain specific issue. And I could look at a non-MOOC online science course. So the museum has a program called Seminars on Science that has a, sci a climate change course that is online for six weeks and you get three graduate credits at the end of it. So I could do the same study there and compare that to these results to see if there are differences in the findings there. Um, so that's what I'm working on now. I'm doing a, a follow-up study now, modifying some of this initial design, continuing to collect data in the climate change course uh, to see if I can build on this work in the future. But that's pretty much the, the summary of my work. And I would be delighted to learn about what all of you are doing in this area um, and to talk about maybe ways we can collaborate on some research in the future. And of course, happy to answer any questions you have about the study. Great. Thank you so much, Maria, for this exciting topic and for excellent presentation. I enjoyed uh, listening to you. And uh, okay, and now it is time for a Q&A session. And uh, yeah, and we have the first one. Okay, uh, I will voice the question for you, but you also can, Maria, you can also read this in chat. The first question is from Anastasia. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have a question. It is stated in the paper that there, there was a 20 minute threshold for post-test completion for data filtering. How was it determined? Yeah, so that 20 minute threshold was um, in the Coursera data, every quiz submission has a timestamp. So that, like module one pre-test had a timestamp and the module one post-test had a timestamp. If the module one post-test timestamp was less than 20 minutes from the pre-test, we didn't include that data because it meant that they didn't do any of the content in module one. Um, the content took more than 20 minutes. So if they didn't spend at least 20 minutes, we know that they didn't really go through the content at all. So we use the timestamp data for that determination. Okay, thank you so much. Natalia is asking, uh, did you inform participants before or after enrolling in the course about the experiment? Yeah, we informed the participants twice, um, both times before enrolling in the course. So af as soon as they enrolled, they got an email message with a link to the IRB official form from the City University of New York. We also included a message on the homepage of the course and anybody who did not want their data included was able to get copies of the quizzes and the answers outside of the system so that they could take them privately without having their data contribute to the study. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. Mm, okay, Gregory is asking, thank you, it was very interesting. Could you please explain why you excluded everyone under the age of 18 from the sample? Yeah, so two reasons. Um, first was the City University of New York is very strict when it comes to using data from minors. And so they strongly encouraged me not to include their data. But separate from that, my goal was to look at pretests and feedback among a group of learners who are not typically studied. We study kids all the time. We study how they learn, how they respond to teaching. Um, 
there's less literature around testing and feedback with adults. So I did want to focus on the adult population. Also, the course is designed for adults. It's a graduate level science course. Um, so it was designed to be taken by adults. And at the end of the day, I only had to filter out six minors from the study. So there wasn't a significant decrease in the number of responses. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. Uh, Natalia is asking, uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. Here are some questions. The first one, what was the difficulty of pretest items? And was it possible to control whether students had taken the pretests seriously or just clicked on random answers and didn't read feedback? That's a great question. If you can figure out number two, Natalia, you'll be, become a very, very wealthy person. Um, so no, it wasn't possible to control whether or not students actually read the feedback. I, just excuse me, uh, I, 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 I wish to be this person because we can do this. So we have these statistical uh, procedures like psychometric procedures, which uh, uh, helps us to identify just random responses. And uh, I think probably we can just, yeah, just use this data to, yeah, to, to check this idea and just to select uh, possible um, respondents uh, with high level of um, uh, probability of randomness in their responses. We should absolutely talk then after this, because yeah. I would love to learn how to apply that statistical procedure to this data set. Um, yeah. the, I don't want to forget the first question, the difficulty The first level. one was, uh, what was the difficulty level of uh, pretest uh, items? Yeah, so the um, all of the questions, the pretest and the post-test, they weren't difficult in that they weren't designed to trick people. Um, we didn't give very similar answers designed to really make people think and wrestle with the options. Um, it was just designed to understand whether or not we could use the pretest to teach. So they weren't common climate change um, questions, but if you knew a little bit about climate change, you might get a couple right. We weren't trying to trick people by making them too difficult. They The questions mapped very specifically to the content in the course. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Vladimir is asking, did you consider the predominant type of assignments or course content affect the results of the study. What if this type will be programming assignments or peer review? There are a lot of feedbacks in training platforms for programmers like DataCamp or Yandex Practicum. I suppose they should affect students in MOOCs. Yeah, so we didn't use a programming assignment um, because it felt overly um, complicated. Like we weren't, we were, multiple choice suited our purpose. There was no need not to. And multiple choice testing was specifically one of the things we were investigating. The course content, yes, may have affected the results of the study. Most MOOCs rely more on videos than on essays. And the courses at the museums are a little bit flipped. We have a lot of essay content in our courses and that absolutely might have had an effect on um, the outcomes of the, the research. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and for and I just want to get to the point about peer review. So yeah, in the very initial version of the climate change course and all the museums courses, we did do a peer review assignment. And over time, what we found was, you know, we'd have a thousand people enroll in the course in a week, but only you know, twelve people would do the peer reviewed assignment. And so we didn't have enough people doing the peer reviewed assignment to provide enough peer reviews people would submit their assignment and then they'd have to wait a month to get a grade. Uh, so we moved away from that because people weren't um, enjoying the process. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, Evgeny is asking, what is the idea behind course persistence? Did students need to finish quiz or to get a pass grade or just watch some videos to be considered as persistent on some particular yeah. module? So module persistence was, um, did you did you do the quiz for that module? So I would say that Dimitri did three modules if he did the post module um, assessment for those three modules. Um, so if you did the post test, you got credit for completing that module. Mm -hmm. Okay, it makes sense, clear. Uh, Ekaterina is asking, Maria, thank you for the presentation. What do you think about using feedback also in post tests? Could it supplement the results to evaluate the effects of the feedback? That's a great question. Um, and yeah, it might 
it might be a better place for it. Right now, based on this study, what I would say is um, from, this is now from my museum hat, not my researcher hat. I would say don't write feedback at all. And I would say that because the evidence in this study suggests that people don't use it. And it is so expensive to hire people to write good feedback, um, at least <coughs> in the US. Um, and so I would rather take that money and spend it on making new courses than on creating content that I have evidence that says people aren't gonna use. Um, so that's not a great answer, um, but right now I'm leaning away from feedback just because of how much time and money it takes to do it well. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, okay, Irina is asking next question. the next question. Thank you for the presentation. What do you think, what is more effective, formative assessments or pre-testing with feedback in terms of feedback for students? I understand that they are two different tools based on different modalities. For example, pre-testing can be necessary in adaptive learning. I mean that formative assessment also provides students with feedback that can help them identify areas on which they should focus. I think that this, this is a question about, um, I liked your, um, uh, the last slide about this switching, like shifting from completion to learning. And maybe like, uh, uh, like this formative assessment is more about learning when we use some testing procedures to, uh, like to boost performance, to boost engagement and uh, yeah, yeah, some, something like this. But yeah, it is a question for you, so yeah. Yeah, so pretesting is a type of formative assessment. Um, so I, I don't, I'm not sure, maybe Irina can can shed some light on the question. So um, the the groups that took the pretest and got feedback, it was a type of formative assessment in that um, it showed them, particularly with the elaborate feedback, it showed them um, what the correct information was regarding that question. Um, more effective is an interesting way to put it. I think the most effective feedback is the one that a student's going to use. And unfortunately, what we know about the literature is that that's going to differ from student to student to student based upon their own personal history with teachers, with feedback, with grading systems. And so what is most effective for me is not going to be what's most effective for you. And that's the challenge of doing feedback well. Yeah, I see. I just want to have a clarification from Irina. Irina, did you mean that, like, uh, we mean by formative assessment that we use like separate questions separately, like not within the one test before the course, but just like several several questions, uh, uh, like asked uh, like separately. For instance, he or she, a student, watches lecture number one, and he or she received the quest the the question number one. Then he or she watched or read the material, then he or she receives the question. So not all the, all the, like all the tests uh, at the same time. Did you mean this one? Yes, yes, uh, you're completely right. Ah, okay. So just to, just to distribute the questions through the course, not, uh, not, it, not put all the questions on the, uh, like before the course starts, like a pretest. I see. Yes, yes, uh, I mean this. Interesting. So the pretest had five questions, the post test had 10. And we didn't want to do more than that because we didn't want fatigue, test taking fatigue to become something that made people not want to take the, the quizzes. Um, it's an interesting idea though, like instead of doing five questions all at once, if we did like one question before each essay, um, that's interesting. In the study we're doing now where I, we moved the location of the pretest, Mm -hmm. um, to just, but we do it right after the content before the post test and we call it a practice test. We're wondering if words have any effect on this. If you call it practice, maybe more people will do it because it feels yeah. like just that, like it's like very low stakes. Um, but that's a great idea to just do like one question before a video and one question before an essay. Um, that's a really great idea. Yeah, and maybe it would like, it would, uh, uh, positively aff affect the engagement and also like learning uh, performance. Like when we just use like a small portions of questions, like only one question before one video and yeah, right. yeah, 
Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you very much for this question and for your responses. Uh, Daria is asking, uh, thanks uh, for the presentation. How did you decide which text will be included in the feedback? Did you use literature or expertise? Oh, I used expertise. I am not a scientist um, of climate and uh, that would have ended badly if I had been the one to write the feedback. So the course was written by a climate scientist who works at the museum and it was written in 2011. Uh, nope, it wasn't written. Yeah, uh, around then. And so when I started the study in 2019, I got together with her again and I asked her if she would write the quiz material um, because that's what she does for a living. She teaches this content both face-to-face -face and online. So I relied on expertise. Uh, she identified each of the themes in all of the modules and then wrote the pre-test and the post-test questions for it along with all the feedback. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you very much. Carlos is asking, mm, uh, excellent presentation, thank you. The general trend in the literature has been to indicate the importance of interaction between teachers and students for effective feedback. Would you say that the lack of interaction could explain the not significant differences among the treatment groups? Could you somehow change this for upcoming experiments? Yeah, absolutely. Um... That personal interaction is huge when it comes to feedback. And I think it could be, I think it affected both the scores and persistence. I think lack of engagement meant people maybe weren't likely to look at the feedback and lack of engagement also meant they probably weren't motivated to continue because there was no human or peer interaction in the course. It was very isolating and self-guided. We could change it. Absolutely. Um, but you know, that's, um, that just requires more money because then it's paying a scientist to be in the course and serve as the instructor. And so I think that becomes then just a matter of uh, finances and whether or not an organization like the museum is willing to pay people for this type of research. But yeah, I think it would make a difference. I would for me as a learner. Great, thank you so much. And uh, Dennis is asking, <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, thank you. Did you consider that people getting protests had results and those who got bad scores were less motivated to complete the course? It could be that in protests group, uh, people who completed the course were more motivated. Therefore, they studied more thoroughly or just had better scores during the course in general. Yeah, I'm just reading the question again. It's a good one. Um, so the first part is people getting pretests had results. Yeah, it could be that people who got bad scores um, were less motivated to complete the course um, for sure. And I guess one way to test that would be to see if um, in the control group on the post test, if people who got lower scores were the people who dropped out of that group as well. I guess that's the way to test that. Um, to look at people who scored like below a 60 across the board and see if they were more likely um, to drop out. And then the question becomes for people who take pretests, do you hide their scores or not? And I think off the top of my head, I would say no, um, because you have to tell people what they got wrong in order to give them feedback on it. And so I don't know, I don't know if that would work, um, but it's a great point. Um, and then the second part is um, in the pretest group, people who completed the course were more motivated. Yeah, that could absolutely be true. I would say people who completed the course across the board, pretest or not, were more motivated um, because they're certain they didn't get anything for taking the course. Nobody did. Um, there was no course credit. There was no forum. There was no live instructor. So I think MOOCs are absolutely a referendum on intrinsic motivation when it comes to learning. People who have a desire to do it persist. People who don't probably need extra incentive. Um, so that's a great point. Yeah, thank you so much. So we have no questions uh, at now in the chat, but I have some, um, some thoughts about the presentation. Uh, it remembers me uh, some our studies. So last year we did a study uh, with Alexandra Urban from Coursera, yeah, um, and from William Kuskin from Colorado University and uh, yeah. Michael uh, Daria Kravchenko uh, from HEC University. And the idea of this study was about to check whether rewatching video lectures 
impacts the learning uh, impacts the performance on second attempt uh, to pass the test. Why we did uh, this study? So uh, because at all platforms like Coursera, edX, and other platforms, as a general uh, like digital pedagogy advice, we have like after a um, failed uh, uh, attempt, uh, please provide the learner with actionable feedback. For instance, uh, just rewatch the video and try again. And we just wanted to check is this uh, activity like rewatching video lectures makes a, a positive effect on uh, uh, performance in a test. Be because uh, it, so the literature is very limited for this topic, but uh, we have a lot of, um, Mm, uh, a lot of uh, uh, literature, scientific literature, about effects of rereading. So when students reread the material and then uh, tries uh, the test again, and the the results are quite ambivalent. So it has positive, negative, and moderate effects. And we found that I like so it is uh, that our findings uh, were first that the situation is different in different courses. For instance, in some courses, the effect can be positive. In some courses, the effect can be like, uh, like null and negative. Moreover, the effect can be different within the course, but based on assessments. For some assessments, it can be positive, negative, or null. But the, the main finding, I think, for me, that, uh, that uh, uh, the effect is different for each item. For instance, for one item, it was extremely important to rewatch video lecture. For second item, it was like indifferent. So yeah, rewatch or not rewatch, you will not have gain some additional uh, chances to respond it correctly from second attempt. But for some items, we had significant negative uh, results. Uh, yeah, yeah, and now we are, uh, so this paper is now, uh, so we have it in, in preprint, but now it is in the computational education journal under review, so we are expecting a review soon, uh, but uh, I think that uh, I liked your idea that it is, it is difficult to generalize, so always we, always when you try to find some educational effects, we see that the effects are different, or if the effect are the same in these conditions, we cannot generalize it to another conditions. And yeah, and I think that, um, but even if these studies, so your study and our study are different, but they're quite like on the same, the same area of how we use uh, these tools, like tool of pretests with feedback or the tool of uh, rereading or rewatching. Yeah, so thank you so much for, for your presentation. Uh, Okay. Uh, do we have all? Uh, do do we have questions? No. Okay, uh, Maria. Maybe you have like uh, concluding remarks or some thoughts about uh, after our uh, discussion. Yeah, I would just say thank you all for being um, a great audience. And um, just because the pandemic is still going on doesn't mean that we can't. Um, collaborate or work together on future research. So if you have ideas about building upon research around feedback or testing, um, don't hesitate to reach out. I don't know if Dimitri, if you can share my contact information with folks. Um, I can also just put it in the chat if anybody wants to follow up, but I'd be happy to talk about whether or not we could collaborate on, on a research paper. Yeah, thank you so much. We have shared the paper uh, with the announcement and also after each seminar we produce uh, like a YouTube video. So we do, we will do some, uh, some uh, editing. Uh, we'll add some subtitles and so on and we will produce this YouTube video and I will share the link with you. And, and within the description to this YouTube video, I will put your uh, contacts. So all the audience can also reach you through this content. Talk Contacts. Also, I think that I will uh, send you for sure uh, our our uh, mm, preprint about the study yeah, I mentioned before, weird. and I think it would be very interesting to uh, to work together on 
checking the randomness in uh, responses of learners because I think it, yeah, as you told that uh, the, the person who knows this, uh, how to do it <laughs> would be a rich person. So yes, <laughs> it's funny. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, thank you so much, Maria, for uh, being with us. And I wish, uh, and I would like to ask all the audience to unmute themselves and join me uh, in warming applauses uh, to Maria. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Maria. Okay. Thank you, Dimitri. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, our next seminar will be almost in one month, so we have it in May fifth. Uh, I I have no uh, I have no um, I have no notes about who will present. Excuse me, I'm sorry for this, but for sure we will have the next seminar. Uh, uh, okay, again, uh, Maria, thank you so much. Thank I you. wish all the audience to stay healthy and safe. Yes. Uh, uh, in this uh, difficult pandemic time, I wish uh, all uh, all the audience uh, to yeah to yeah I wish uh, the time when we can meet in person will be will, will be soon. Okay, thank you so much. Have a nice Thanks. day in New York and have a nice evening in Moscow and uh, in different parts of the world too. Okay, thank you, Maria. Thank Bye. -bye. You. Bye. Thank you.